Hey, Facebook Live, hope you are doing well. And uh, I wanted to jump on today because, as many of you know, uh, whether you listen to uh, the uh, I Practice by Design limited run podcast series or the current uh, Patient Paperwork Minute podcast, which really is close to a minute, uh, this week has been pretty epic in terms of healthcare, in terms of disruption, and all of our lives are affected. And frankly, uh, there are times in life when uh, we all have turning points, we all have moments of convergence, and uh, you've probably, if you've uh, followed me, uh, those of you who do follow me, uh, you know I've been thinking about healthcare a lot, you know I come from a family of a lot of uh, nurses, physicians, pharmacists in my family, in my extended family, and you know I care about this. And in life, sometimes we have convergence points. I thought that I was too far ahead of the curve, and then I realized that this was a convergence point. I realized that the things that I have been talking about every single day uh, for so long, um, for, for several weeks and months, it's all about sustainability and healthcare. It's all about margin. It's all about uh, the different areas of healthcare. And we're seeing all of that stuff right now at a major tipping point. Our lives are affected. The stock market has gone, uh, been impacted by 30% the last that I looked. So that's uh, uh, that is, what is that? What's $10 trillion, $11 trillion? Is that a, how many figures is that? I don't even know. <laughs> is that like nine figure, 10 figures is a billion. I, I don't know. I'll go back and calculate it, but that is a lot. And I wanted to come to you with some sustainability solutions, opportunities with the caveat that I'm not a doctor. All right. I see what doctors do. I see how hard they work. I see that nobody else studies the most, sleeps the least, borrowed the most for medical school and uh, works the hardest in residency. Nobody does that like the doctors. And you know what? There are nurses who work very tirelessly. There are administrators that are doing the best they can. Everybody has an opportunity right now to get on the same side of the crisis. Uh, we know that the word crisis, uh, you've probably heard the original word means opportunity as well as crisis. There is an opportunity in the crisis. I hope that we can stop politicizing this get on the same side of the line and fight this thing together. And I'm doing that as a sustainability designer. I just want to offer up some helpful resources. And um, I would love and appreciate very much if you commented, even as you're watching this possibly after the fact, go ahead and ask a question. Go ahead and share this to somebody that you know who works in healthcare. Start a watch party do whatever that you feel like you would need to do to give some hope to the people that we all know who are serving us so well. Now, with that said, I'm going to try to keep this to a half hour. I've got about 18 slides. I'm going to talk about a number of different things. I'm going to talk about the following. I'm going to talk about um, uh, some free resources. Now, even if you're not in healthcare. Uh, there are a lot of distributed teams that used to be in person, and now they're off-site. Now they're completely functioning remotely or partially functioning remotely. Guess what? I've worked remotely for a long time, and so have a lot of great instructional designers that I know. I'm going to point you to some of them because I don't have time to deal with the issue of the distributed teams. I'm trying to focus on making a difference in specifically healthcare and in the things that you're going to talk about, I'm going to show you some resources that can help you. You might be in education, you might be in management, you might not be in healthcare yourself at all. Everybody, even those uh, also in healthcare, can utilize these resources that I'm going to show you. Um, and we're going to talk about how to flatten the curve, which you don't need my help with. That's what we're all trying to do right now. I'm going to talk about hashtag keep it flat, all right? Because after the curve is done, we're going to need society, we're going to need to keep it flat, we're going to need to value that margin of the healthcare system. There's not going to be much, 
But after you hear some of these suggestions, these opportunities, these ideas um, that I am in the midst of proving with real data, then that will be helpful uh, to you uh, for being able to value that margin and keep it flat. Right now, hopefully, hopefully we're starting to approach the peak of flattening the curve, I hope, but nobody knows. So we're all going to hunker on that. We're going to be diligent. But once we turn the corner, which might be sooner than you think, we need to keep it flat. And that's what I want to talk with you about today. Now, I'm going to talk about one of those areas of how to keep it flat. Once we get over the hump, we've got to rethink, all right, the one-to-one patient to nurse, patient to physician uh, thing. Uh, There's got to be scalable, sustainable communication. And you know what? I want to also say this. Physicians, I love you. Um, This is your deal. You've earned the right to practice any way you want. So one one thing as I talk about this, I'm going to talk about how important it is to self-opt into this. I don't want anyone else, any administrator, any healthcare system to mandate these so-called sustainability tips that would be completely beside the point. These need to be voluntary. They need to be self-opt in. Otherwise, we're going to see more burnout in not just the general population because everybody's burned out. It's not just nurses or physicians or everybody has studies to say they're burned out. So nobody cares tragically about that, except maybe in times like this. So this needs to be, I'm going to try to appeal. I'm going to try to suggest. I'm going to try to influence in in an open-handed way some of these things that I've been thinking about for more than a year. Um, There's a backstory. You can go through my feed on social media. You knew I grew up literally about six feet above my father's rural family medicine waiting room until I was 10. I saw this stuff up close and personal. It's really, really important. I'm going to talk about what everybody can do, all right? Everybody, every physician can take their post-operative checklist that they have, like I did, all right? And many of these are Xeroxed, and you're going to see how ugly they are. You can digitize them very easily, very quickly, and then you can optimize them for mobile so that your patients have it when they need it. Not when they're home, not when they open the filing cabinet, but moment to moment when they're in the coffee shop, when they're in on the bus, when they're on the subway, when they're about to get, you know, uh, 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 impacted when they should be recovering. We've got to make this stuff available anywhere, anytime for patients. I'm going to show you how to do that. I'm going to not give you the specific steps because I've already recorded a webinar on that, um, but I want to talk about that. Now, I'm going to talk about specifically four ways to enhance your patient post-operative checklist for mobile, to, to let them go with your patients so that they have them anywhere, anytime there's an issue. Uh, so that you can extend. It's almost, remember, the DVDs had extended features. Well, you can do that with your little analog sheets of paper. They don't have to be static. They can be scannable and they can expand. There could be special features. Imagine like a DVD um, giving your patients special features, extended content, so that they get context without having to call you and interrupt your staff in the middle of a global pandemic like we're in right now that is wiping out trillions of dollars. Imagine having fewer people calling in, having fewer people talking to your staff or talking to you if you're a physician. Imagine that, all right? This is what I've been talking about with margin. And it takes a pandemic for me to to, to realize I need to tell more people about it. And then I'm going to talk about this. Oh, you're going to, uh, I mean, this this is something I have very little capacity to do, but it's important for reasons I'm going to talk about in this webinar. So let's go back and let's talk about some, actually some resources for your global team. So hopefully as I advance this, and actually we're going to talk about this real quick. All right, this is something I posted uh, uh, about a week ago. These are the things that we can control, all right? And I know it's a little bit small. Let me adjust the little button here. There we go. 
These are the things we can control. Imagine that. We can control our attitude, number two. Number three, our thoughts, our perspective. Number four, we can talk, we can, uh, uh, number 10, the risks that we take. Uh, number 11 is big, how we interpret situations. All right. Uh, a lot of great things on here. All right. Uh, number 25, whether or not we try again after a setback. I got to thank Dr. Michael Hines. He's the superintendent on Long Island. I think it's the Port Washington School District. I originally saw this and I scraped it on Instagram off his Instagram and tried to tag him. Uh, I think I did, but I don't know how you share things on Instagram. I don't think that you're allowed to unless you personally take a picture. Um, but anyway, this this goes. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Michael, for that. And I thought this would be a helpful resource for everybody. Let's continue uh, and move forward. All right. I'm going to give you um, all of these things I've already gone through here. Now, you got to meet a couple of great people. Um, the first is Carl Kopp. He wrote this uh, LinkedIn article for just anyone who is stuck in a situation where it's an emergency uh, distributed team. This was also uh, shared by the, uh, the Department of Instructional Technology at Bloomsburg University that I graduated from. Uh, I've spoken at the conference many, many times. Can't go wrong with Carl. And this is great whether you're in healthcare or whether you're not in healthcare. The, these are experienced online teachers, online collaborators. You're going to find uh, the Tuckman uh, theory of group. Uh, you've heard it, group dynamics. Um, I think that's going to happen when offline, in-person teams find themselves online. There may be a new process of reforming, restorming, the renorming, and then we get to maybe performing, and then we're going to adjourn at the end and go back to face to face, hopefully. Uh, but there can be some great tools that you can learn in the meantime. So you got to check out Carl's article. Um, another great resource. I saw this from my friend and uh, colleague, Mark Burke, uh, lives right down the street from where I grew up. He is offering, and this may not be available by the time that I'm even saying this. I, I'm sure that he got snatched up and booked out weeks in advance with the the issues uh, and the needs that there are. Um, but he's basically offering, you know, free of charge to help in any kind of situation, especially academic, um, any kind of K-12 or online learning development, any of that stuff, go check out Mark. And if he is already booked up, he will tell you he's booked up and he'll probably, he'll probably uh, shoot a, a little note uh, for me. I may, not, I may or may not do this uh, the next time we have a global pandemic, depending on how this goes. But I wanted to sh value a shout out from Mark. And you know what? There are hundreds of other alumni of the, the Bloomsburg program, as well as instructional technologists that do this. They eat this. They breathe this. They sleep this just like I do all day long. And there are hundreds of them that can help in any kind of situation like this. Uh, that's what we do. So anyway, here we go. All that to be said, and I've been talking for half my time almost, um, all that to be said, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to flatten the curve today, and we're trying to keep it flat tomorrow. And I love this because um, what, what a great uh, visual. So we're all saying, hey, this is overblown. Um, the numbers aren't as catastrophic as they are in China, all of that. This is the infographic that helped so many of us quickly understand without having to get into a Twitter flame war or a Facebook you know, flame or take sides or get political or whatever. This is sustainability in a nutshell. We have limited margin, limited capacity, and if we'll just all self-select uh, and self-quarantine a little bit and, and just take a little bit of a pause button, uh, from our normal activities, we can reduce the strain and we can reduce the damaging effects of all this. So it's so important. I got to give a shout out. Um, uh, Dr. Krisha Palmer uh, is an amazing, check her out at housecallsforphysicians.com. She is a coach. She is herself a physician. 
uh, who is actually doing um, all kinds of margin enhancing activities, such as interior design and other things that are more focused on wellness and wholeness and life harmony and balance. She is the one uh, that, that had this up there uh, last that I saw and keep sharing this infographic because it's so very important. All right. Now, Let's get to my thesis here, and I'm going to call it a thesis. I'm going to call it a um, an experiment. I'm going to call it a theory because what? You're, you're scientists. You're in healthcare. You know that data drives everything. You know that data changes uh, our beliefs when we see the actual data, and we you know that data can sometimes change. We can improve data, and, and what I'm going to uh, say is that this is my theory, because I have this belief that I want to collect more and more data on. Sorry, I'm hitting the button. Um, I believe that the mundane things in healthcare will create the margin that we need for sustainability. And I believe that it will create a major, maybe even a massive advantage for the forward-thinking physicians and healthcare organizations and nurses and administrators that carry them out. What does sustainability? The sustainability is all about margin, right? So you saw it right here. Margin allows us to scale. Scaling allows us to free up more margin, right? And we want to put people first. We want to put patients first, but not at the expense of the entire system, not at the expense of the entire system being overwhelmed. And these are the kinds of trade-offs that whether you believe in human right healthcare or whether you believe that it's an aspiration, whether you believe that we should all, you know, simultaneously demand it, all 330 million of us demand it right now at the same time, what, whatever the case is, we have limited availability, all right? It, it might, you know, be a human right, but we haven't figured out how to fly the plane. We haven't figured out how to generate that kind of margin that we could actually do it in a way that doesn't result in losing the doctor that we were promised uh, that we would be able to keep, for example. I'm not being political. I'm just stating we haven't been able to figure it out. You remember that website? Remember the, the button, the little beach ball on your Mac uh, as the website went down? We, we couldn't deliver on that promise. All right. So we need to scale. We need margin. All right. And we need sustainability. So I'm trying to do two things here. <laughs> this is my next little menu item here. Um, I think what I'm going to do is try to disable that piece. Oh, wow. There. And, and now I'm not blocking the way anymore because the title is gone. All right. Thank you very much uh, for letting me do that. All right. Let's go on to the next one. All right. So this is really important, my friends. Um, we've got to, in order to get margin in the middle of a pandemic and after a pandemic, in, in, the, in the aftershock of a pandemic, all right? The last time we had any kind of disruption like this uh, in terms of our actual lives, not the wallet, not the checking account, not the 401k, not Wall Street, but this kind of systemic disruption that I can remember 20, 19 years ago in 9-11. All right, I was cold calling on the cell telephone, <laughs> the cell phone, and, uh, and, and that was not an easy day to be calling people up and trying to, to sell on the telephone and, uh, and generate uh, business and all of that. Not a good day. That was the last time that I can remember, you know, almost global, probably globally, at least in the United States, uh, Western Hemisphere, possibly, that we had this kind of disruption. So uh, in order to get the margin that we need, I'm just suggesting as a designer, can we begin, begin to open the conversation about rethinking the one-to-one -one communication that has been the hallmark of medicine since really the dawn of time, all right? Since the dawn of time, it's been the patient-physician, the physician-patient relationship. That's what motivates that's what has caused all doctors, all right? If, if you're a physician and, and that's not what got you into medicine to do 100-hour weeks in residency, to risk life and limb and lawsuit every single day that you go into work, to borrow 
more than any other uh, occupation in student loans that becomes, uh, you know, a, a not an easy thing to deal with. And then to have the rest of society say, oh, you're, they're just a rich doctor. Look at the car that they drive. And they have no idea. We have no idea the sacrifice that physicians have made. And I maintain in my podcast, physicians, not administrators, not HMO CEOs and executives, physicians are the leaders of healthcare. That's why I listen to people like ZDog MD. That's why I, I'm actually part of his premium community because I believe in what he does. I believe in what he's doing. He's rallying a cry for physicians and nurses and other providers in healthcare to stop being abused and stop being micromanaged. All right, don't want to get into that. That's that's more Z Dog's thing. But I, I'm really glad to see these voices out there. But I'm going to say this for sustainability purposes, at least in the short term, and probably in the midterm. I think that it's time as a designer. I think it's time to at least consider opening the conversation outside of one-to-one uh, conversations only in medicine. 9-11, 20, 19, 20 years ago. Remember, it took us 10 years at least to build the building again. It took us at least you know, five to 10 years to really start moving past that, and we're still fighting wards that, that came uh, out of that. So... Um, you know, that's a little bit of context. I believe that it's going to take months to start, you know, if not years, and there are going to be aftershocks here in healthcare uh, and lessons learned and new best practices about how to uh, get margin when you need it, how to um, talk about maybe the ideal of healthcare as a human right, but at the same time, uh, you know, we're, we're going to voluntarily set aside certain rights of assembly uh, so that we don't overwhelm everyone who's doing their job in healthcare. All right. So anyway, as I've been going on this rant, you have read everything that I have here. And by the way, um, I will say this: a, a couple of things on the physical presentation, the bullet points. I'm not a big bullet point person, but I put this together very quickly when I realized that today was the day that that really uh, I, I believe that that I was to talk about this stuff. I'm not going to wait anymore. I'm going to bring some of these thoughts. I've thought about this stuff for a long, long, long time rolling around in my mind. But the piece here that I want to talk about, it's critical that physicians self-select, self-opt in. Uh, any of these things that I'm suggesting, if you are an administrator, if you're a hospital CEO or executive, this is not intended to micromanage. I know how you're going to think as an administrator. You're going to want to micromanage. Oh, good. We can squeeze more water out of this stone. No, everybody's still burned out. Now, before this, they were super burned out. Now, everybody is, is even more overwhelmed. However, there's a heroic heroism like 9-11. Everybody that's going into work, everybody that's engaging with the public, everybody that's interfacing uh, and trying to communicate in real time and build this ship at sea, um, there is a noble nobility, uh, a heroism uh, that can, I believe, get us out of the immediate crisis so that we can start considering some of these things. So I, I believe, you know, can, can somebody open up the conversation so that we don't have to repeat ourselves? one-to-one -one repetitive conversations. I'm a patient, all right? I'm not the best patient. I'm calling in. If there's something I don't understand, I know you don't want me to guess and take a so-called educated guess. I know you don't want me to doctor Google and, and just Google search and think that I know how to interpret everything. I know that might sound insulting to patients, other patients besides me, but I know that as providers, you don't want me doing those things. So I'm saying, hey, educate me, all right? Uh, uh, help, help empower me, um, and I'm going to give you some suggestions on what to do with your checklist, with your patient paperwork to expand them, extend them, so that I don't have to guess and you don't have to have me interrupting your staff or you and overwhelm you with a repetitive Groundhog Day style conversation. Do you remember Bill Murray in Groundhog Day? All right, one of my favorite Bill Murray movies, not because it was like I, I walked out of the theater in 1993. 
I saw Bill Murray in Groundhog Day. I was like, I'm not going to watch that movie again for 10 years. And I think I watched it again maybe a year ago. It's been like 30 years because it was the same thing. That's how your life looks like, especially without sustainable solutions. All right. What could you do instead? I'm going to hide myself so that you can hear this. All right. What could you do? You could do group patient mentoring. All right. You could do patient group sessions, group, not exams, but you could, you could do patients in a group. You could do Q and A, you could do a, like almost like a radio show. All right. I, I mean, why not have fun leading, um, you know, everybody else has a tribe. Why don't you have them waive the HIPAA requirement? I'm not a, a lawyer, but I'm sure that people could self-select, patients could self-select in so that you could basically mentor them in their health, all right? Um, be a tribe leader, all right? Be a role model. There is a new association for healthcare. Um, and why did I completely forget about the work that Austin uh, Chang and, and his board are doing in, uh, in, in this? I'm going to look it up right now because it is so important that you get some role models uh, on this uh, S- ahsm.org. Um, I am going to put this. This is what you want to check out. Uh, AHSM, it's the Association for Healthcare Social Media uh, underscore org. And you go there on Instagram. There's some uh, exempl- exemplars. All right. You want amazing clinicians at the top of their fields, multiple collections of degrees who are rocking social media like natives, all right? A lot of them are millennial. They really know how to do this stuff. It's amazing. I'm subscribed to so many of them. They are mentoring. They are leading. They are spreading solid uh, peer-reviewed information in a responsible way, in a catchy way, in a visually engaging way. They are stopping misinformation. They are stopping... um, uh, unethical things. They they have their first conference coming up here in Philadelphia, where where I'm uh, I'm 30 miles outside Philadelphia, and they're ha- you you've got to check them out. I will tag uh, them in this broadcast with a timestamp uh, so that they can add anything relevant to this that they might want. And it's a great board. Uh, instead of just being social media rock stars, what they did is they said, let's form a board because we need new standards for social media in healthcare because this is about communication. This is about crisis communications. This is about uh, being, as as my friend Melissa Agnes, uh, whose, whose book is taught in Harvard, um, uh, 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 this is about her term is crisis ready, and we are seeing crisis ready right now. We are also seeing things other than crisis ready right now. Where am I? I'm on the 28-minute mark. We're not going to wrap this up in a half hour. That's okay because I'm going to scrape off the audio for those of you that have a commute in the home. No reason for you to have to watch this glued to a screen. You don't need to do that. You should have different modalities depending on different lifestyles. And nobody has a lot of time. So don't worry. Just ping me as a result of this. Say, I want the audio. I'll give you the MP3. And I'll give you the slides of this happily. So these are some ideas. All right. We've got to do it collectively. We've got to do it in the group. Um, uh, There are so many other ways. This is just you know, a couple of ideas off the top of my head this morning, in addition to what the ideas that you're going to see in just a moment uh, from my case study. All right. Uh, This is what your patient uh, checklists and patient materials could look like. All right. Um, It is so important uh, to to use everything at our disposal. Again, I'm not I'm not a doctor. I'm a designer. I'm a sustainability designer. I'm an instructional designer. I've taught this stuff in graduate school. I've done all of these different things. Uh, really, for this, I'm going on my second decade actually doing that. I'm not I'm I'm not five years into this anymore. I'm on my second decade doing this. And there are so many minor. Remember the minor and mundane things that that we can do to engage patients, we can expand the margin, we can make things sustainable, and we together 
can make an impact. All right. So now, have you ever seen at patients who are watching this and hopefully sharing this uh, and spreading this um, th- this content to other people you know in, in in healthcare? Has this ever happened to you? All right. Not 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 you physicians, but have you ever seen something like this? <laughs> All right. This is this is called the 97th generation Xerox. All right. And and you see hashtag yuck right there because it's like, man, all right, 1981 called and they want their patient post operative checklist back. Now I took that and I turned it and all the, I did is I digitized it very quickly in about a half hour. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you the specific steps for that because I've already recorded it. Just let me know if you want to know this so you can do it yourself or delegate it to your tech person. They can do it. All right. I turned that into this. And actually, I didn't even have the the uh, the things that you're going to see um, in, in, in a moment. Uh, and I did that. I digitized a very ugly um, uh, referral form that I had. I, I got a referral from an emergency physician. Um, on behalf of an in- interventional cardiologist. And this is a post-operative checklist. And it was taking a lot of time to repeat this checklist. And the patients didn't know, you know, is that a six or is an eight? Or is it, you know, is that an an N or is it an R with an extra blotchy toner blotch on it? We don't know. All right. Um, patients, do, do you feel loved? I have a question for you. All right. Do you feel loved? When, when you get handed an obviously Xeroxed, even, even something that's just a little faint, not crisp and clear and warm, do you feel love? Do you feel a connection, you know, to your doctor? All right. Or do you just suck it up and say, you know, healthcare isn't, you know, it's a human right, but we, we haven't really been able to improve it to the level it needs to go yet. Um, do you just suck it up like I do and say, you know, uh, patient form? If, if you're watching this right now, I'd love to know, what do you think about Xeroxed forms? Do you enjoy them or do you loathe them as I do? All right. Well, I think we can do better in terms of post-op forms. How about this? Huh? Take a look at that. What if we could make, the without having to spend, you know, $100,000 a year for a, an EMR electronic medical record subscription or, or whatever else is out there, um, or a whole lot more than that, or a little bit less than that. What if you could do this yourself? All right. What if you could just take your checklists, your post-op forms, make them mobile, make them digital, and then make them mobile so that patients could actually put your checklist in their pocket along with their library of music that Steve Jobs told us we could put in the pocket. Guess what else we can put in the pocket? We can put post-op checklists, patient educational materials. We can do a lot when it comes to patient checklists and educational materials. I think in a week like this, a month like this, come on, March, March rolls around. It's like apocalypse time out there. It is not easy and I think that we need to consider doing everything we can do, especially the minor, the mundane things, to make things sustainable, to grow some margin, to, to explain a little bit more to patients through enhanced features, just like on a DVD has those bonus features. Imagine bonus content for your patient post-op checklists and other things. Imagine a world where there were no more Xeroxed ugly forms that didn't make patients feel uh, just kind of a little bit warm and fuzzy. All right, imagine a world without that anymore. All right, let's talk about the checklist a little bit more. All right, here's what I believe. All right, and again, I want the data to, to prove this or to prove that it's not far enough along and we need to make some changes to the prototype or whatever. I want data. All right, I'm going to show you in a moment, uh, not in a moment, in a few minutes, um, a, a way to partner with me, with your doctor, or if you're a physician and you're a really forward-thinking physician, 
and you you've been thinking about these ideas. These aren't my ideas. It's really your ideas. You've been. I, I'm just maybe uh, someone who's articulated some of them a little differently. If you want to partner together on this, so that I can get the data, and together we can interpret the data and make this better, um, I'll give you a way to do that. But I have very limited capacity for that, just like you do right now, because of the the crazy that is out there. But I believe that simpler, cleaner, clearer patient materials can do all of these things. They can save time. They can increase patient safety. They can increase, this is what you really want as a physician. You want us as patients to, to adhere, all right? So if I have this sheet crumpled up somewhere and it's folded and it's just kind of icky like a used newspaper on the subway, <laughs> all right, um, I might still pick it up. I might still really study it diligently, but I might not. You know, I may need to print out my own. Cl maybe just, maybe just my weird personality type that likes things clear and clean and crisp. You know, all the other personality types. Maybe they, they, you know, the the used uh, newspaper in the subway post-op sheet that's all wrinkled up. Maybe, maybe they adhere to that more diligently than I would. All right, I'm being candid with you. But I know as a physician, you want me as a patient to adhere. You want me to closely adhere. All right. And I want to help you put the patient checklist in the patient's pocket and know where to go so that they can interact with maybe even the bonus features of that checklist that they can access. They can hear your extended explanations about the why behind the what. All right. Patient checklist. It's like, do this, don't do this, do this, do this, don't do this. What if you had a little summary at the bottom? All right. What if you had the do's and the don'ts? All right. If you're a person of faith, then you might recognize this. Thou shalt and thou shalt not. Right. That's a good patient post-op checklist right there. Do this, don't do this. And you, at a glance, what if the patient had this thing laid out in such a way that the patient at a glance, can remind themselves without having to scrutinize all of this stuff, but just at a glance, oh, that's right, I'm not supposed to run around the block for another two days. I'm not supposed to sweat for another two days. I'm not supposed to get on a plane for another two weeks. All right, or I am supposed to clean out the wound, for example. All right, do this, don't do that. This is where cognitive the, the theory of cognitive load that I talked about, you know, uh, my friend Mark Burke from earlier, he's an expert in cognitive load because he is an instructional designer. And that's what we do as instructional designers. We try to do everything we can to reduce the cognitive load because there might be a global calamity and we don't want a heavy, hard to understand cognitive load. If you've heard uh, Don Miller uh, who's an author turned business uh, magnate. His story brand framework has helped me out a lot. Um, I'm not yet associated officially with that, but I want to give that a shout out because it's really been great. He talks about bowling balls that you're carrying in your brain, all right? And if you give the person too many bowling balls, they're going to drop a bowling ball and it's going to be tiring for them. And we, we, we're just beyond the point in society, uh, with, especially with 15%, of the population, you knew 15% are functionally illiterate. So even if, if these things aren't Xeroxed, they're not easy to, to, to read for everybody, all right? And, and how much easier if you gave them a different modality? Maybe they, they want to watch. Maybe they just want to listen, like I'm, I'm going to scrape this MP3 because I'm already going over time. Um, and I want you to listen to this on the drive home and share this with a colleague who doesn't want to watch it, but maybe they'll listen to it double speed on the way home. All right. However you concern, it's not about learning. It's about how, what's your preference and what are you going to activate? And are you going to listen to it or not when you've got your, your phone is filled with a hundred other fun podcasts that you want to listen to? All right. And that's what the patient is doing, too. But I think patients will listen to your podcast. I think patients will listen to your recordings, your directions, especially when you take the time to explain it. So anyway, um, moving on as my throat becomes a little <laughs> a little tired already. Here we go. Now, four ways that we can enhance your patient 
post-operative checklists. All right. Now I have an example. You're, you're, uh, you see, Dr. Herman. I, I was feeling in a goofy mood when I did the, the prototype. I have a paper prototype right now. You go to patientpaperwork.com and opt in. Um, it's a little janky right now, but I will supply you with that prototype, especially if you remind me right now, I've got an, another um, uh, uh, offer right now about how to patient-proof your patient post-op checklist at patientpaperwork.com. And uh, you connect with me, and I will also give you the patient the, the paper prototype that I am working on right now because I'm building all this stuff out in real time. I realize that you don't want to watch me talking about this. You don't want me to tell. You want me to show. And so what I'm doing is creating a show-and-tell prototype that you can actually go in there. I can show you, and you can actually text yourself your own uh, uh, example of what could be your own patient paperwork checklist. You could text it to yourself. You could you can see it right here. You can dial a IVR um, is called what is that? An interactive virtual uh, recording. I think I may be getting that wrong, but but that's when you dial by extension and you can actually speak into the phone and say I'd like to reschedule my appointment. Reschedule or checklist. I lost my checklist. Send me a checklist. Press one or say checklist and you can listen to your checklist or your patient who might be more elderly. I don't want to be ageist. That would be horrible of me, but I do believe in general that, uh, you know, a certain age group that is younger is going to be really into the QR code and they'll scan that right in. They might think that's kind of neat. They might give you a bonus point. They might adhere more closely to the post-operative instructions because you had a little nifty thing that they could do. But there's another um, uh, demographic that might be older that all they know how to do, there isn't even a rotary phone anymore, right? But they know how to dial the number and they know how to hit one or hit two to set up an appointment with you. It's the same technology and they can listen to their checklist again, or they can find out other expanded things, or they can reschedule, or they can hold and, and listen if they really have a, a specific question that isn't a repetitive question. You could have frequently asked questions that they have to listen to um, before they, they reach out to you, all right? Now, we, we're not trying to push the patients off. What we are trying to do is keep it flat. Hashtag flatten the curve, and then once we do that, all right. Once you do that, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just sitting here looking beyond the current like I like to do. We can hashtag keep it flat. And this is all about margin. You can go on the web. You can scan the square. You can see all of that sort of thing. And uh, really, really simple. What would this do for your practice if you had this kind of solution? And it's not hard. And you stick with me. Go to patientpaperwork.com. You will learn, all right? You will be able to access DIY instructions to do this, or you can delegate it. I don't know that you want to manage too many additional projects right now, but you can delegate it. If it's the kind of thing you absolutely have to hear it from me, you absolutely want to talk to me about it, then there's a way that you can do that, um, possibly. But first, I'm collecting data uh, for people. So you want to check about check out the the thing that I've already talked to you about right there. Now, interactive voice response. I was close, all right? This is when you say one or you hit one. And you can see I'm building this stuff out already. I mean, it's pretty neat stuff uh, the way that it works. There, there are all kinds of little... It's not even really programming because there are drag-and-drop solutions. So... Um, this is something that is easier than you think. It, you know, some of you physicians that are watching this right now, you're like, oh, tell me, you know, how to do this. Well, happy to to resource you with this. I'm going to maybe, you know, I haven't put together a resource guide, but I can certainly do that. Go to patient paperwork, get on uh, on my mailing list so that you can email back to me and tell me what you want from me. And that would be really um, helpful because then I could be more helpful to you. But this is the kind of thing anybody can set it up and, uh, you know, how, how cool. I mean, it's like you can, you can take your practice into the 21st century. Well, we've been there for 20 years, Nathan. Yeah, the technology, this technology 
um, I think was there 20 years ago, but now it's super duper accessible and you can program and set it up and drag and drop and make it work yourself these days. Isn't that groovy? Isn't that nifty? Now, I think I started talking about Dr. Herman. Dr. Herman is a pseudonym uh, because I was in a goofy mood and I forgot to get to the point about the goofy mood. Uh, the point of the goofy mood, um, the point of the story is I, I put, so I put this uh, little prototype together and you can see uh, Dr. Herman lives at 1313 Mockingbird Lane, as does a certain beloved television show character, Herman Munster. So I was in a weird mood, uh, you know, Herman Munster, whatever. Um, and these are all the things that you can do. This is what it looks like in a patient paperwork um, uh, post-op checklist. All right. Now, this is what I've talked about in the patient paperwork minute. I talk about how to actually take your analog Xeroxed uh, patient post-op sheets, do an audit, find out how many of these you need to digitize so that you can print them so that they don't look like garbage when you hand them to the patient because you want the patient to adhere. You want the patient to have this in their pocket. You want the patient to, to not miss anything that they need, that they need to do so that your patient safety numbers go up. You want, and, and everybody wants the patient safety numbers to go up because that's our safety as patients. So these are some of the things that I did. I did an enhanced piece right there for bonus content right to the phone. And then, I mean, this is something that any, I mean, I could, I could try to create a product out of this, you know, but it's so simple to set up if you only had the time. And I know you don't as a physician, you don't have the time, but you have staff people there. You have tech people that you know that you could delegate this to. And yeah, it's not easy to manage a project, but you probably can. And, you know, if, if you want to work directly with, you know, somebody that, that actually has been thinking on the level that I've been thinking to put some of these together, because you probably have other uh, issues and challenges that you need a good thinking partner. That's where I prefer to come in, not, not doing the stuff uh, alone, but really thinking about these problems and these challenges, and then ultimately the solution right there. Now we're almost done. So wrapping it up, this is a little bit about the pilot program. If you say, absolutely, Nathan, I want to work with somebody like you, uh, go with the other person that's that's put forward these suggestions right now in the middle of the pandemic. I'm sure there's a whole bunch of people that are talking about this stuff because we should, because we should be thinking in terms of systems and scalability and margin for you. We should say that the patient, the physician should be in charge of these voluntary um, solutions, not any hierarchy, not any CEO. So, it, you know, go, go for the other people that are talking about these things. If you can't find anybody else that is talking about some of these things, then this might be for you. I have a pilot program. The purpose of the pilot program is to get more data to help me to see if indeed a, a prettier checklist results in better patient adherence, and if that better patient adherence results in better recovery, faster recovery, fewer complications, and better safety scores for physicians that digitize and provide extended mobile features to their patient forms. Did that make sense? So you private email me for details. I'm going to work with a maximum of three physicians on this. Um, I didn't, I, I didn't uh, choose... I chose not to go into any more detail about this because I figure if somebody uh, looks at this and they, they really like everything that I've been talking about, they might want to work. I'm going to have a very short questionnaire. I may explain at that time what's involved. But basically, uh, I'm going to do the same thing that I did with uh, Dr. F, who actually, come to think of it, I didn't really tell you about the case study. What did I do? What did I do? I'm going to say this very quickly. What did I do in the in the case study? So number one, I got a referral from an, an emergency physician. His friend, a interventional cardiologist, had zero margin 
was spending way too much time repeating himself with what I call single-use conversations. Those are the Groundhog Day conversations that that really I, I don't think should ever be um, be be done, or very, very rarely, repetitive ones, all right? One-to-one, but repetitive. I think that those should uh, be one-to-many. Um, I think physicians should have more time for this stuff. So what did I do? How did I do this? It's the same thing you can do, all right? You don't need to be part of the pilot program to do this. You could do it yourself. You could create your own conversation with yourself about the checklist, and you can just go through it go into the why behind the what. And that's what we did. We set up a little appointment. We did the virtual studio. You see, I have a, you know, I have a fancy microphone. You don't need the fancy microphone. You don't need the pretty paneling on the wall. You know, it helps if it's nice to listen to, if it's easy to listen, if it doesn't sound scratchy, like a, like a audio equivalent of a Xerox form that helps. All right. Um, But basically all we did is we just talked through the form. That's all we did. And I said, and then I, I would ask a couple of little questions about, oh, why is that so important? And then that creates a little bit of a context so that patients know the why behind the what. And that's what we did. And then the rest of it is just me editing the, the video and scraping off the audio like I'm going to do to you, uh, for you, it's to you. I'm going to scrape off the audio because this went longer than I thought. Happy to do it. Then you can listen to it in the car on an MP3 instead of being stuck in front of a screen like I'm sure nobody ever wanted to do anymore after the year 2003. The screens got old. Am I right? All right, so final piece right here. A couple yet more resources. Uh, Download the checklist at patientpaperwork.com. That gets you connected to me. Um, go, Go beyond social media. Connect with me. Uh, so that you can email directly to me, tell me what things are helpful, what things maybe weren't helpful. Maybe maybe you say, hey, Nathan, you need to get to the point about X, Y, and Z. We don't care about A, B, and C. All right, I listen to all the feedback, and that is important. Now, listen to the Patient Paperwork Minute. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on pretty much every major podcasting thing. And then this thing over here is the... Um, the master. I only talk about one of these tiny little points each episode, and uh, I've done a pretty good job of holding every episode down to under four minutes or so um, in the patient paperwork minute. So it's not 20 minutes. It's not one minute, um, but it's pretty short. And I talk about from an instructional designer perspective, all right. Cognitive load. Remember the bowling, bowling balls, like Don Miller says, in the brain. You don't want to give your patients bowling balls. They're going to forget. They're going to give up. They're going to assume. They're going to get guess. And that's not good for adherence. That's not good for patient safety. That's not good for your safety scores. And that's not good for the hospital that you work for or with. And if you're self-employed, that's not good for your practice. So, uh, you know, I talk about these issues, not like I'm a doctor. I'm not a doctor. I'm a designer. And I believe, and this is my closing line, I believe when we master the minor and mundane, it will create a major, massive advantage and margin for you. Thanks for watching. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for doing a watch party with with any uh, other physicians or other nurses or other healthcare providers or healthcare workers that you know. I know that I'm connected to so many people on Facebook and on LinkedIn and all these places who are working in hospitals. This was not an easy week for you. This is not going to be an easy month for you. I am on your side and so many other patients are on your side. We are cheering you on. Share this. Let's get you the margin that every physician and other healthcare worker deserves. I'm going to sign off And don't forget to go to patientpaperwork.com, get the checklist guide to patient proofing your checklist, and then get email access to me so that you can connect with me in that way. Hey, thanks everybody. And thank you for sharing. If you want the audio, again, go on to patientpaperwork.com, reach out to me via email. I will send you the audio and you can listen to it as you're jogging in the gym, wherever you are not in front of a 
screen. Take care, everybody. Um, we're all in it together. Thanks for helping to hashtag flatten the curve. Take care.